Coronavirus Infectious Disease 19, a clinical case. So in this session, we're going to look at a clinical scenario with a case presentation and use that to examine distinguishing features which may help us to differentiate infection by SARS coronavirus 2, the cause of COVID-19, versus other respiratory infections currently circulating in the world, those being influenza A or B, para-influenza, rhinovirus, and even some other typical pneumonias. At the end of the presentation, we'll also look at what factors uh, precipitate a risk of progression. We'll start with our case, Mr. Lecturio, of course. This is his history of present illness. He is a 62-year-old male who comes to us in clinic with fever, cough, and malaise for three days. Importantly, he, two weeks ago, was evacuated from a cruise ship, which was approaching Venice, Italy, due to a, a cluster of cases occurring in that part of that country. Uh, however, after arrival back in the States, uh, he was fine until just three days ago and then presented with these symptoms. The fever is tactile. He's not measured it. Uh, however, the cough is dry, non-productive, and he denies any associated chest pain or certainly shortness of breath. The malaise, very typical flu-like illness, so tired, somewhat decreased appetite, just sort of moping around feeling not very well. The major features we should notice here are, number one, his age and the fact that he is a he. He's male. Uh, these are risk factors already emerging in COVID-19 as potentially suggesting more severe or advanced disease. He's had his illness for three days, uh, not weeks, but three days, but he also had two weeks ago an exposure to a known uh, source of COVID-19 disease via this cruise ship uh, and especially the country Italy. However, as we look at other infectious disease processes, simply being on a cruise ship, simply being on vacation are all going to increase risk for other respiratory viral pathogens. So none of these are specifically going to, to delineate COVID-19 as the causative uh, disease here. The tactile fever, the cough, which is dry, uh, but no chest pain or shortness of breath, these are all very likely early presentation signs and symptoms for any viral process, as is the decreased appetite and the flu-like process. Review of systems for Mr. Lecturio, he denies a whole bunch of things, so really no, no upper respiratory tract signs or symptoms like rhinorrhea or congestion. He denies signs of cardiac dysfunction, so no chest pain, palpitations, dizziness or sweating. He denies prominent GI symptoms, so no nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, or no abdominal pain. Uh, no rashes to suggest sort of a viral exanthem, which might go with other types of viruses, and, and no confusion or hallucinations, which could go along with, if not viral illness, potentially uh, other psychiatric disorders or even uh, encephalitides or encephalopathy. And then no decreased urine output. Uh, he denies uh, urine changes, which argues against end organ dysfunction so far. However, he does endorse headache, a diffuse nonspecific headache, and diffuse myalgias and polyarthralgias. Past medical history, he does have hypertension, which is ostensibly controlled uh, with losartan, which is an angiotensin II receptor antagonist. He also uh, recently has been diagnosed with type 2 non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, which he claims has been controlled with diet. Social history, he's a certified public accountant, married with two children, two adult children. Uh, he had the travel, as recently noted, and no other known sick contacts or exposures, such as unusual animals or pets or anything like that. Family history, uh, also uh, there are uh, primary family members with hypertension, coronary artery disease, and insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. So again, what leaps out of this from this additional history? is that Mr. Lecturio has two additional comorbidities, that being hypertension, being treated with losartan, and a diabetes mellitus. The certified public accountant, uh, yes, this might be a high-stress position, we're worried about it more because it means he has extensive face-to-face -face contact with a number of his clients, which means rather than having no sick contact exposures, he has potential for sick contacts. Again, that travel history, he had significant potential travel exposure from the cruise ship and also that part of the world where there was known COVID-19 circulating, as well as other respiratory viruses. And then the family history, again, significant four comorbidities, which we know are associated with worse disease or progression of disease with COVID-19. Physical examination for Mr. Lecturio. So he indeed is febrile with a temperature of 38.6 degrees Celsius. Uh, he is somewhat tachycardic with a heart rate of 98 and tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 22. 
His blood pressure may be not as well controlled as he thinks it is, with the Losartan is elevated at 143 over 92. The rest of his exam, however, at this point is normal. This, by the way, is very typical for early onset COVID-19 patients, as well as other viral respiratory and upper or lower respiratory tract infection patients. So not much to speak of, including the chest exam, in which his lungs are cleared auscultation with good air entry throughout. So where are we at? Initial assessment. He does have risk factors, which should make us think of higher risk for developing COVID-19 disease, as well as progression to severe disease. However, his presentation at this point is still very much nonspecific. It could be anything and everything. Similarly, his physical examination does not lead us in any one specific way. So what is our differential diagnosis? Well, of course, COVID-19 presenting with mild upper respiratory tract infections and potentially progressing, but not yet so far. Influenza, we know, can start with a flu-like illness, as noted. So fevers, myalgias, polyarthralgias, general malaise. Um, and th this could be all that he feels with influenza or it could progress. Parainfluenza, typically a cause of croup uh, in younger children, but certainly a cause of a, a staccato dry cough with respiratory distress in adults who experience it and with a very prolonged clinical course. Early onset uh, symptoms, however, with parainfluenza, just like the first two I've already discussed, can be very nonspecific. Fevers, malaise, dry cough. Similarly, rhinovirus. We all know about the three days coming, three days with us, three days leaving history of the common cold. The cough would be a little bit unusual for rhinovirus unless he's having post-nasal drip. Similarly, the malaise, although if he's having a man cold, he could be experiencing that. So this could still be rhinovirus, which just is a little bit more overt in its presentation. And then other possibilities, bacterial pneumonias such as atypical pneumonia, perhaps caused by mycoplasma pneumoniae or chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, or even some other unusual possibilities, Legionella, for example, um, all acquired via his cruise ship exposure or face-to-face -face contact uh, because of his employment, his work. So what do we do next? At this stage, does he deserve further evaluation? Does he deserve further intervention? And at least from the COVID-19 response, the answer is no. He has mild disease. He's in no distress. He does have risk factors, but given the current shortage of testing kits in many parts of the world, it would not be possible, I should say, um, to do formal testing for COVID-19 uh, because the ability with limited testing kits is somewhat reduced. However, it would be reasonable to consider testing for the other viral possibilities. So a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab uh, to send for rapid assessment for influenza A, perhaps uh, other respiratory pathogens on a panel. And then let him go home, shelter at home, self-quarantine, watch, wait, and see what develops. I will note, however, we have one critical lapse in, in our initial evaluation, and that is a, a spot check of his peripheral oxygenation, assessing his SpO2, which, if it were less than 93%, would be a strong suggestion uh, of concern uh, for progression in COVID-19 and might tip us into admitting him or at least sending him for further evaluation. However, we don't have that, so at this point, Mr. Lecturio goes home. However, he comes back to us two days later with persistence of his initial presenting complaints, but his cough is now worse, still not productive, but he's finding it difficult to breathe uh, both from a tightness of his chest and also shortness of breath associated with the coughing. He now has even more pronounced anorexia. He's lost his appetite completely, still no other GI symptoms, uh, and still no new complaints other than as noted above. His examination continues to demonstrate a highly febrile adult male who is still tachycardic, even more tachypnic, and now without even uh, changing his medications, his blood pressure, if anything, is low. So we now have a patient who has become hypotensive, which is definitely a cause of concern. This time, we remember to do our spot check for his peripheral oxygenation, and indeed, he has a, an oxygenation of only 89% on room air. This is cause for concern, regardless of the viral etiology, but certainly, if we're considering COVID-19, this would be a trigger uh, for us to do further evaluation and further intervention. His chest exam now demonstrates diffuse fine crackles bilaterally. His air entry is adequate but not great, and he does show increased work of breathing. The rest of his exam, however, is unchanged. So again, what should leap out at us is the worsening of symptoms, especially the cough, the development of shortness of breath, 
and an associated decreased peripheral oxygenation of less than 90%. These are two red flags for COVID-19 suspect patients that would significantly uh, suggest a need to do further uh, intervention and further evaluation. Similarly, he now has evidence of hypotension, which could be a complication of advancing COVID-19 or of uh, potentially a superinfection uh, from a viral etiology with a bacterial sepsis. So long story short, Mr. Lecturio has got our concern, our interest, and we need to consider what to do next. So uh, what are next steps in the assessment? Uh, if we haven't already, we'll certainly wish to evaluate for other viral etiologies and consider now testing for COVID-19 Given the, again, fairly nonspecific nature of the presentation for all of these, uh, Mr. Lecturio could still have any one of, of the, the uh, etiologies you see listed on the screen in front of you. Any of the influenzas, parainfluenza, rhinovirus, coronavirus, COVID-19 disease, uh, anything else. What are the next steps? Uh, do we now consider testing? What do we do next? And in fact, we may wish to consider doing uh, blood testing along with testing specifically for COVID-19 and also considering imaging. What are we going to see with these in the setting of COVID-19? CBC, we're looking especially for either a normal or potentially reduced peripheral white blood cell count, so leukopenia, along with a lymphopenia, reduced percentage of lymphocytes, and maybe even in some cases about 40% so far, thrombocytopenia, decreased platelet count. The inflammatory markers, we're looking to see an elevated C-reactor protein or creatine kinase, an elevated lactate dehydrogenase, something to suggest that there is cytokine storm and or inflammatory burst occurring uh, as these are highly associated with advancing disease in COVID-19. Organ function, we absolutely want to see where his kidneys are at, where his liver is at, where his heart is at. So, so doing a comprehensive metabolic panel to include signs of or uh, indicators of urine function, liver function, liver numbers, uh, and then uh, sending cardiac enzymes, all of which are, are indicated. Doing a blood gas, uh, if we want to confirm to our, our lower peripheral oxygenation and see, is he indeed failing to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide? Uh, what is his pH? Do we have respiratory acidosis, alkalosis, etc.? Sending a blood culture, well, yes, because even if this were COVID-19 or other viral etiologies, there still could be the potential of a secondary bacterial infection. Yes, we want to consider COVID-19 testing because we now wish to do further emergent care. Mr. Lecturio re requires help, and we need to know if he is a, a suspect patient. Then imaging, considering chest radiograph versus commuted tomography or CT scan. Of the two, the CT scan will be more specific and sensitive for findings that we wish to, to demonstrate in the setting of COVID-19. Chest radiograph, however, is easier to obtain, easier to perform, and thus uh, may be the first step while we're contacting uh, the radiology suite to get our next set of testing. So in this case, with the, the anticipated results as we just discussed, Mr. Lecturio's results start to come back. And indeed, his complete blood count shows a low white blood cell count of 2.7 or 2,700 cells per cubic millimeter with 67% neutrophils, 25% lymphocytes, and 5% monocytes. So indeed, he now is leukopenic and definitely lymphopenic. His hemoglobin and hematocrit are normal, but he is thrombocytopenic at 85,000. His inflammatory markers demonstrate slight elevation of the C-reactive protein with 4.7, normal being less than 3, and his lactate dehydrogenase is also slightly elevated at 360. Moving on then to his organ function, indeed he shows evidence of, of uh, some early renal insufficiency with a slightly elevated blood urea nitrogen of 24 and an elevated creatinine of 1.4 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, in addition, his transaminases, AST and ALT, are 85 and 79 respectively, although his total bilirubin is normal and his troponin I is slightly elevated at 0 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. So, so he has evidence of, of mild uh, multi-organ disease, which would go along with potentially invasive bacterial sepsis, uh, a SIRS, like systemic inflammatory response syndrome, but, but also with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, which can be seen with more advanced or severe COVID-19 disease. His blood glass, obtained from a material source, shows a slightly elevated pH of 7.47, a low partial pressure O2 of 55 millimeters mercury, 
partial pressure CO2 of 32 millimeters mercury and its bicarb, HCO3, is in the normal range of 25 millimoles per liter. But then and again, his peripheral oxygenation is low now at 87%. Blood culture. Yes, a blood culture uh, is sent in this case to look for bacterial uh, uh, superinfection or pathogens and is negative at 48 hours, which suggests, it doesn't exclude, but it does suggest that there is no bacterial superinfection at this stage. Chest radiograph indeed was performed just because it was easier and faster to obtain, and it showed the typical nonspecific bilateral infrahyalur air space opacities, which could be seen with any viral process or, or even a nonspecific atelectatic changes. However, there's no evidence of increased fluid because the cost of vertebral angles are, are clear. A chest CT scan, though, does demonstrate bilateral nodules and the expected peripheral ground glass opacities throughout uh, the lung fields, uh, as well as some mild intralobular septal thickening. All of these can be seen in COVID-19 disease uh, and also to a, a, a significant extent uh, in acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, caused by a variety of pathogens. So where we're at then, what are the ultimate diagnoses? Uh, in Mr. Lecturio's case, rapid testing for influenza came back negative, as did uh, molecular diagnostics for other respiratory virus panels. Uh, this does not not completely exclude those diseases, but it makes them less likely. However, his nucleic amplification assay is positive for the SARS coronavirus 2, the cause of COVID-19. So we, we can make a, a strong uh, presumptive diagnosis of COVID-19. Knowing, however, that co-infection is still possible, especially with influenza and also potentially bacterial superinfection. So, so this case presentation shows a typical progression and typical findings for an advanced case of COVID-19, however, which began with mild disease. And you can see, at least I, I hope you can see, that, that it's very difficult to, to differentiate COVID-19 caused by SARS coronavirus 2 from other viral pathogens causing upper and lower respiratory tract infections. Uh, however, hopefully this case is instructive in, in looking at, at how a patient may progress and ultimately come to medical attention and deserve further evaluation. Now, looking specifically again at what I've shared with you with Mr. Lecturio, what is his risk of critical disease? Looking at his age, age 62, well, so an age of 65 has been looked at as a strong cutoff above which a risk of critical disease is quite significant. However, the risk begins to escalate even in, in the, the late uh, 20s. So age 62 would be a moderate risk factor for risk of critical disease. However, uh, and specific to this case, Mr. Lecturio does have two uh, comorbidities, that being hypertension and diabetes mellitus, both of which increases risk for severe disease. Further, when he represented to us the second time, the peripheral oxygenation was less than 93%. He also had elevations of his transaminases and a worsening of his renal function. So he has multi-organ dysfunction, some hypotension, definitely a difficulty in, in air exchange and oxygenation, and an impending hypoxic respiratory failure. So Mr. Lecturio's risk of critical disease is actually quite extensive, and this case would suggest uh, one who definitely deserves hospitalization, close monitoring, and further support as necessary. So to wrap things up, uh, starting from a mild, nonspecific illness, yet with risk factors which we've identified, and also with comorbidities, uh, this case shows a, a very unfortunate but typical progression into much more severe critical disease uh, along the way being differentiated from other viral pathogens which may contribute to or cause instead of the disease which we're looking at as caused by COVID-19.